sensuous enjoyment is the entire purpose of wine. The art of appreciating it is to maximize the pleasure of every maneuver, from choosing to swallowing. The art of serving wine is to make sure that it reaches the drinker with all its qualities at their peak. No single factor is as important to success or failure as temperature. It is hard to exaggerate the importance of temperature to the full enjoyment of wine, but equally hard to lay down simple guidelines for getting it right. The ideal storage temperature of 50 degrees Fahrenheit also greatly simplifies the serving of all wines except fine reds. White wines, Champagne, Rosés, Beaujolais, and other light reds can all, if necessary, be taken directly from the rack and opened without further preparation. If the wine is stored at a higher temperature or conditions are warm, the only truly efficient way of chilling it is by immersion in icy water. A refrigerator is fine with forethought, but what a fridge achieves in an hour, an ice bucket achieves in ten minutes or less. The ice bucket should be about half full of ice and water, depending on the size and number of bottles. The object is to immerse the bottle or bottles right up to the neck. A handful of salt speeds up the cooling process further. Achieving the perfect serving temperature for red wines is not so easy. Individual tastes vary. The traditional notion of room temperature. Is meaningless when dining rooms may be anything from 60 to 75 degrees Fahrenheit. The best rule of thumb is that all red wines should just be cool enough to refresh the palate. The precise temperature that achieves this and yet brings out the aromas of wine is somewhere between 55 and 64 degrees Fahrenheit. One method of warming a wine is the reverse of the ice bucket method to cool the wine. It is perfectly sound to put a decanter of red wine into a bucket of warm water until the wine reaches the required temperature. Almost all wines benefit from a little aeration before drinking, particularly those that have been in a bottle for some years. A mature white can come alive by being poured from a little height, so that it splashes and bubbles momentarily. Red wines are customarily decanted with the same object. Added to the essential reason of pouring them clean from their sediment. Red wine with a sediment can be prepared for decanting in two ways. With sufficient foresight, it can be taken from its rack and stood upright for long enough for the sediment to settle from the side of the bottle to the bottom. Sediment in certain wines is so fine that this can take two or three days. Without this preparation, the bottle must be moved from its rack. Directly into a cradle or basket which holds it, just enough for the cork to be drawn. The wine is then lifted out of the cradle and poured into a decanter in one continuous movement. A torch or a candle is needed to throw light through the bottle, so that the sediment can be seen approaching the neck and pouring stopped in time. Consideration to the type of wine glass is important if you want to embrace the wine's bouquet. Your glasses must be two things: large and clear. Small glasses not only look mean; they have to be filled to the top. There is no possibility of the wine scent collecting in the top of the glass, so that when you drink, the scent and flavour comes to you all at once. A wine glass should never be more than half full. For half a glass to be a reasonable measure, the glass has to be big. A good wine glass, in short. Is a big one, clear and uncoloured, so that the true colour of the wine can be seen. The glass should preferably be with a stem and a round or roundish bowl to capture the bouquet of the wine. Sparkling wines are best served in a slightly smaller but relatively taller glass, filled to about three quarters of its capacity, giving the bubbles a good way to climb. One of the prettiest sights wine has to offer. Dessert wines, being stronger, are served in smaller portions in smaller glasses, usually filled to between half and two thirds of their capacity. Wine glasses should be as clean as you can possibly make them, achievable after washing by thoroughly rinsing in hot water and drying with a clean linen or cotton cloth. 
if the sense of taste were located in the mouth, where our impulses tell us it is, anyone swallowing a mouthful of wine would get all the sensations it has to offer. The nerves that receive anything more distinctive than the basic sensations, sweet, sour, salt and bitter, are higher in the head and deeper in the brain. In fact, we smell tastes, rather than tasting them with our lips and tongues and palates. The real organ of discrimination is in the upper nasal cavity, where, in normal breathing, the air never goes, and the only sensations that can reach it are the vapours of volatile substances. To reach the brain, the vapours of wine need to be inhaled, either through the nose or mouth, into the upper part of the nasal cavity, where they are dissolved in moisture. From the moisture, long thin nerve processes take the sensations to the olfactory bulb above the nasal cavity and right into the brain. It is often remarked how smells stir memories more rapidly and vividly than other sensations. It seems that smell, the most primitive of our senses, has a privileged position of instant access to the memory bank. To assess the wine's characteristics before tasting, look at the colour of the wine by tipping the wine in a glass against a white background. Look to see if the wine is clear. Is it red-purplish, which denotes a young red, or is it turning to brick red through age? Swirl the wine to volatize its aroma, then inhale deeply. Almost everything about a wine is revealed by its scent. The first impression is the most telling. The taste in the mouth will confirm the information given by the nose. Take a good mouthful, not a sip, and let it reach every part of your mouth by chewing on the wine. Holding the wine in the mouth, draw air between your lips. The warmth of your mouth helps to volatize the wine producing a greater impression of taste as it materializes at the very back of the mouth and as vapours rise to the nasal cavity. After swallowing, or spitting the wine, take judgement of the flavour. Is it short-lived or lingering? The marriage of food and wine can make a great meal a memorable one. But attitudes to matching wine and food range from the slapdash to the near neurotic. It is a subject that is attracting closer study than ever before. Few combinations can be dismissed outright as wrong, but generations of experience have produced certain working conventions that certainly do no harm. Wine has certain basic enemies at table. Its first is vinegar. A vinegary salad will turn the wine to vinegar. This is a matter of science, not taste. Its second enemy is acid. The acid of grapefruit, orange or lemon. You cannot taste a wine with any of these fruits. A third enemy is often oily fish, which has a tendency to make red wine taste steely, something like the taste of tin cans. All these things positively spoil wine, so it is a waste to serve it with them. Beyond this, though, taste is an anarchy, so the following are only a suggestion of combinations. For hors d'oeuvre, the typical mixed hors d'oeuvre leans heavily on vinegar for its savour and thus becomes the enemy of wine. However, as most of the courses we start meals with include artichokes, avocados, tomato salad, radishes, carrots and cucumbers, eggs, smoked fish or sausages, these are happy with the remains of the glass of sherry, which was an aperitif. Alternatively, a first glass of whatever is to be the main wine of the meal goes well with the hors d'oeuvre. The principal exception to this simple arrangement is shellfish, which are always best with a very dry white wine. The association of oysters and chablis is no accident. The sharpness of the wine does something essential to an oyster. It has the effect of a squeeze of lemon. Champagne is equally effective as too is the less expensive muscadet. All meaty and savoury hors d'oeuvre are fine with an ordinary red or rosé. For soup, there is no need for a special wine, as wine often goes into a number of soups, 
particularly madeira, masala or sherry in clear soup to great effect. The same wines are good sipped with most soups. Pizza, pasta and paella. The immediate thought is Italian wine, especially red with pasta and related dishes. For a risotto made with prawns, suave is an ideal accompaniment. Although it is worth noting, the Spanish usually drink red wine with paella. Egg dishes are very comforting and satisfying, but they are not a good background or foreground for fine wines. A suggestion would be a cheap red wine, for instance, Côte de Rhone. With fish, white wine tastes better than red, because its acidity helps to cut out the fishy taste, which red wine has a tendency to emphasize. Fish dishes with considerable flavor, either in their flesh or in their sauce, are best matched by fairly rich flavored wines, like the more expensive white burgundies and Rhine wines. A young Moselle or Loire wine is best for delicate flaky river fish. Salmon is the exception and can be matched with claret when it is served hot. Otherwise, it goes well with a good white burgundy. As for meat, there is good sense in the old rule about white wine with white meat and red wine with red. Pork, veal and chicken are the principal white meats. Both pork and veal are usually, depending on the sauce, excellent with a not too dry white wine like an Alsace, a hock, a good white burgundy, a Chardonnay, Graves or a Hungarian wine. Light red or rosé will go equally well, but strong reds of real character are best matched with beef or lamb. Tender cuts of beef or lamb are an ideal accompaniment to the world's best red wines. Bordeaux and Burgundy. If there is ever a question of opening a very fine bottle of wine, it is as well to avoid any of the really pungent seasonings of meat, whether they be garlic, mint sauce, or anything flavored with herbs or onions. If the wine's flavor is overwhelmed, there is little point in spending more money on a good wine. For ham, most medium quality reds would be a good accompaniment. Venison can, ironically, be quite at home with a rather sweet white as with a dark strong red. Perhaps the most versatile of all dishes, chicken, can be cooked in a way to go perfectly with almost any wine. Although it must be said, a coq of vin, where the vin is champetain, clearly calls for champetain in the glass beside it. As for game, in general, it is red wine that is called for. A simple rule is to drink very good red Bordeaux with unhung game, very good Burgundy with any game that has been hung, Burgundy with game pie, and either Chateau Neuf du Pape, strong and soft flavored, or rather sweet Rhine wine with duck or goose. It is a matter of faith among wine lovers that cheese is the perfect accompaniment to any wine. Cheese is always served after the meat in France to give you an opportunity of finishing your red wine with it and to tempt you to open another. Perhaps the best wine for cheese is port, which is sweet enough to take care of itself amongst the variety of pungent, salty, goaty, sharp and mild cheeses. You rarely find among sweet wines and sweet food the same kind of perfect match as you do among savory things. Two different sweet tastes in the mouth at once seem too much of a good thing. As a general rule, the heavier sweet wines, like Madeira, Tawny Port, the Muscatels and Tokai, match well with most sweet dishes and desserts. There is much to learn and understand when it comes to the subject of wine. That is perhaps why it is so interesting, trying new wines from the many wine-producing countries of the world, searching for the bargains, visiting vineyards, reading the many books on the subject of wine, or just to enjoy a bottle amongst friends. We hope an introduction to wine has given you a glimpse into the world of wine.